Thank you. Unlike Carlos, who said he had to condense his talk, my talk really is, I put 10 minutes, it's going to probably be five minutes and then you're going to help me. So um, I often use these things as a self-help thing where I come out and talk as an introvert and I tell you some stuff and then you really help me organise my life. Um, and at UX Brighton, at UX Camp Brighton, um, we did a card sort. People helped me sort out my spice drawer, and that's really benefited my life. Uh, today, what we're going to do is I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about information architecture in five minutes. That's disappointing. I've 10 years I've worked as an information architect, and I can tell you everything you need to know in five minutes. And we're going to use the final five minutes for you guys to help me sort out my record collection. So there's a bit of a thought experiment going on. I'm going to tell you some principles, then you guys are going to help me improve my life. So information architecture has loads of definitions. Loads of them are really, really pretentious. There's whole books written about this stuff. Um, but it basically boils down to organising stuff so it's easy to find and it's intuitive. And the way you organise stuff implies meaning to it. And that goes for websites and it goes for the real world as well. Um, and there's loads of ways of kind of doing that. Um, but thankfully, some big brains, this guy is Saul Werman, um, came up with five ways to organise anything in the world. And that's the secret of information architecture. There are only five ways to sort things. And once you know that, you can call yourself an information architect. So five minutes' time, you are all going to be information architects, uh, which will look good on your CV. And then, you know, you can explain to your partners what's information architect. And you can say this kind of stuff. An information architect is the individual who organises the patterns inherent in data, making the complex clear. And that's the point where my wife says, could you get a proper job? <laughs> so, um, let's go through the five ways to talk things. They are, and we'll go through these in more detail, location, alphabet, time, category and hierarchy, called latch because of the first letters, um, that come out of those. Random is not a way of organising things, um, regardless of, of whoever tells you that. So I'm going to go through each of those kind of in turn with some examples of when it works well and some examples of when it doesn't work well. <coughs> so taking location to start with, um, location is a really good way of organising anything that has area, place or space, anything that is spatial. So this is the Tokyo Tube map, um, it's not geographically organised, it's spatially organised, but you get a sense of where all the buildings are, where all the stations are in Tokyo, and where all the important things are in Tokyo. Any map is a way of organising by location. Um, and it features, this one features kind of sequence of events, stations, over their geographic <laughs> location. Um, medical dictionaries are a great way of sorting out information by location. So if you get an acupuncture Chinese medical book, you can understand it, if you understand Mandarin, um, but you can also understand it by the fact that it's pointing to things on the body. So that's organising information by its location. And instructions like IKEA instructions or the Haynes manual, all of those car manuals are telling you something about the information in an easy way because they're using location as well as forming that together. So location requires some sense of space, some kinds of area, some kinds of, of place. Second one, the alphabet. Um, so this is uh, Dr. Johnson's first dictionary. And it's really hard to now think that before the dictionary came around, people thought about organizing words in many, many different ways, not necessarily alphabetically. And it seems really obvious now because of the way that we've used the dictionary, that that is a way to organise words. Um, but it was incredibly revolutionary when it came out. Most times when I go to clients and we talk about big information spaces, they go, we should sort things out alphabetically. That's really, really easy and really, really obvious. Um, and I think out of all of the ways of organising stuff, alphabetically seems the most obvious but gives you the most problems. And this is a really good example. So this comes from the Silver Spoon Italian Cookbook. And publishers have hordes of people working for them, talented people who work as indexers, who write all of those glossaries, all of those indexes at the back of the book. 
So you open the silver spoon book, you go, what am I going to cook tonight? I'm going to cook. Would, would you look for fabulous smoked swordfish? If you had swordfish, would you look under F for it? <laughs> I doubt you would. Um, but then, you know, the last couple in E, exotic beans. I've got some beans. Do I think of them as exotic beans? I, I don't know. So <coughs> alphabetical can seem sensible, but it can give you loads of problems. If, for example, in our imaginary record store that we're going to sort out later, you had Robbie Williams, heaven forbid. You've got a dilemma. Do you put him under W for Williams? Do you put him under Robbie? Or do you just go, we're going to bin that because that's a difficult one to have? <laughs> so the third way of organising stuff is by time. Um, and time is where there's chronology or sequence involved. So um, recipes are a really good example of doing something by time. You know, you do these steps in this order to get... To the, to the end product. Um, other ways of organising by time are timelines, Gantt charts, family trees, something where that information is communicating a lot about chronology within it. So again, music is traditionally ordered by time. Um, and again, we wouldn't think necessarily of ordering music in any other way. And I'm really showing this because this has the, my favourite piece of kind of user feedback um, it's a musical score used by the London Philharmonic, and if you can't see it at the back, one of the horn players is put, turn now or you're fucked, which I think is a great instruction as you're playing a piece of music. Um, and we should have more instructions like that. Um, time is used um, in a multitude of ways. This is the um, Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., which again was really revolutionary when it came out, that up to that point in America, War memorials were done either alphabetically or by rank. And the Vietnam War Memorial said, what we're going to do is we're going to tell the story of the war by the people who died in the order that they died in. So when you go there, it's really hard to find a particular relative or a particular name. But it tells a great story about people dying together, comrades in arms, at a place um, in time. Um, so the physical form is definitely mirroring the message that it's portraying. Uh, the final example of time is Venice. Tokyo is uh, another example of this. Streets in Venice are ordered, um, the post addresses in Venice are ordered by the time they were built. So at some point, um, Venice was built. They went, how are we going to put addresses? I know what, we're going to start by building each of these streets in sequence, and then we're going to number it one, two, whatever, without any thought that Venice might change over time. So at some point, there was a big <coughs> council meeting, people got together, and this seemed really sensible. Let's just do this in time. This is, this is brilliant for social historians, because they can see when buildings were built. It's a nightmare if you're a postman in Venice. Um, but we often build these stuff on websites. We build something that we think is really, really logical, and sensible, but we don't think about future-proofing it, about how that schema we create might break down over time and, and not work as well as we expect. Um, the fourth category in latch, uh, the fourth uh, thing in, in latch is category, and it's probably the most common used one on the web, where we uh, define things by um, similarity. Um, and as you can see, sometimes, in this example, sometimes it goes really badly wrong. And you construct meaning, not deliberately, but you construct meaning by bringing things together that might not necessarily belong together. Um, I'm hoping Mexican food and dog food don't have a relationship in the supermarket. Um, but that's the meaning you get. Um, and if you go to any supermarket, you know, they define themselves by how they categorise those aisles. Um, some supermarkets... Uh, uh, you know, Waitrose has a very different schema to the way Lidl does, for example. But we're familiar from, from category by department stores use it, um, art galleries often use it, where you'll have a gallery of African art, then you'll have a gallery of Impressionist art, where people have got an artificial construct bringing stuff together. But you have to be wary of those kind of artificial relationships. Um, we're used to it um, in the UK by the mad Victorians who wanted to categorise and codify everything. Um, 
and lots of the ways we think about information comes from this upsurge of Victorians and the Edwardians making sure that there was a schema that underlied everything. So um, carrots, tomatoes are botanically a fruit. Um, so, you know, that seems a bit crazy to us, um, but it has that kind of outpouring of there is something within those things that bring them together as a category. Um, there's a great quote of, uh, from Miles Kington of, knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit, wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. So if you have a category, think about it. Categories are really set in culture. Um, so the way that we think about stuff is in, in the Western world isn't necessarily how people think about it in different parts of the world. Um, and even in the UK, different audiences, different groups will categorise things in different ways. Um, there's a book by George Lakoff called Women, Fire and Dangerous Things. Um, I describe it as the Ulysses of the IA world. It's the book that everybody should read, but nobody has read it. Um, it's 600 pages, it weighs over a kilo. Really, it's, um, it's not a very usable book. But the title of that book, uh, Fire, Women and Dangerous Things, comes from an Aboriginal categorisation um, where in the Balam language, um, they define feminine things as scorpions, the sun, women, spiny echidna, fire, hairy mary grub, fire and water. They're all just categorised as feminine objects. Um, and for that, that Aboriginal group, that makes some sense. It doesn't necessarily make sense to us. Um, so category is, can be useful, but it also implies a lot of odd meanings as well. <coughs> the final part of latch is hierarchy. And this is where there's a scale or a perceived value in play. Um, so the, this is a picture of the Quran. And I'm now out of my comfort zone to talk about religion. Um, but the Bible generally is organised by time. Um, you start with Genesis, you end at Revelations. The Quran isn't. It's organised in surahs, and they are organised by the number of characters they have, from longest to shortest. Um, and the implied meaning within that is to say everything that the Prophet wrote has equal meaning. Um, and you can dip in at any point, and it's equally valid. There's no sequence in that story. Um, and so by organising in that way, what they've done is break the sequence and to say that everything is equally as important. More common uses of hierarchy are charts, um, you know, medal charts, the football table, the pop charts, the Times richest list. Um, it's a common way for people to organise things. On websites, the most popular, the most recent, are ways of having hierarchy as a way of organising things. So anything that can be measured numerically can be done hierarchically. And that goes for things like colour. You know, you could take uh, burnt toast and organise that as a hierarchy. Um, I'm showing this because there is a brilliant website if you are slightly OCD, so people aren't either OCD or not. We all exist on the continuum. Um, most of us who work as IAs are quite high on that continuum. Um, but there's a website called Things Organised Neatly, which becomes my Friday afternoon porn in the office. I can look at this stuff and get away with it and call it work. So they're the five ways of organising things. Uh, location, alphabet, time, category, hierarchy. Most of the time on websites and in the world we mix these things up. So um, the periodic table described by somebody as the most elegant organisational chart ever created, um, does that. So horizontally, we have uh, objects organised by atomic weight, and vertically, we have things organised by their category. So I'm going to buy a drink for anybody <coughs> who can tell me what the category is shown in green here. I admire your guess. I was really hoping somebody would say alkaline earth metals. It would have been worth a drink. No, it's set. <laughs> I'm almost tempted to buy you a drink. So now you know everything there is to know about information architecture. You know the five ways to organise stuff. And what I would like you to do 
is to take a minute thinking about the record shop that we're going to set up. But I don't want this to be a normal record shop. Um, I want this to be a really crazy record shop. So what we often do at work when we get stuck about how we're going to organise this stuff is to flip it round. And there's a technique that Edward de Bono uses of let's think about the contrary ways of doing something. And in thinking about the contrary ways that we could do stuff, like the worst way we could do it, the craziest way we could do it, that starts to free your mind in terms of there might be an idea in here that actually is worth pursuing. So I'd like you all to take a minute and think about one of these categories, location, alphabet, time, category, or hierarchy, thinking about our record shop and coming up with a way you have never seen a record shop categorised. You've never seen a record shop organised in this way. And once you've done that and you've got a thought in your head you would like to share, I'd like you to put your hand up and go, this belongs in this category, and my idea for this record shop is it would be crazy brilliant if it was organised in this way. The man here. It feels like question time. <laughs> So the man with beard in the front row. Organise um, every album based on exactly how long it runs for. So starting from the shortest album, going all the way to the longest album. Oh, I like Just that by <laughs> I like that by time. And actually, that would be really useful if you go into record shop and go, "I want to listen to 15 and a half minutes yeah. of music today." You would be able to find it. <laughs> I like it. I am going to ask this person here. Organise it by categorising the studio design. Uh, now, this man knows something about music much more than I do. And what, ca what would you put that under, with, under the latch system? It's probably either a hierarchy, depending upon um, exactly how much thought went into that design, or a category, because there are known categories of actual rules and lines. Cool. Fire away. No, it's more like a longitude and latitude according to the album that's recorded. That is splendid, and, and so that brings a new definition to world music that I really <laughs> like. Ben. The musical key that is played on the first one minute, the minute elapses to the first song. <laughs> I'm liking, I'm, I'm liking that though, because you could go home and you go, I'm really in a F sharp kind of mood tonight. Yeah. All in a minute. Organised by hierarchy by how dissimilar it is to Robbie Williams. Oh, the anti-Robbie Williams shop. Man in the green jacket. Um, Organised it, uh, uh, sorry, time uh, by average BPM. Oh, nice. And actually, as you go around the shop, would you get faster or slower as you get to the door? I, I like a yeah, beat per minute record shop. There's somebody at the back with a red scarf on. Uh, number of explicit lyrics. <laughs> Ooh. So you could then work out if it was safe to play for your nieces and nephews. <laughs> actually, Patrick's record collection would all be just one bucket of extreme lyrics. <laughs> Number of words like that. I, uh, we might have to have more than one record shop at this rate. <laughs> I'm to come over here, Danny. Um, when it was released. The altitude at which it was recorded. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take four more around the room. I'm going to take you first. Um, so the number of instruments used in each of the albums, so you can categorise it from the least number to the most. I like that. The orchestral stuff, you would know you could avoid that. That's up here, and <laughs> some Brian Eno stuff that you might be interested in. Uh, by the hierarchy of how long it took people to buy it, and when they walk into the shop. Ooh. <laughs> that reminds me, so I used to work in a record shop, and as a slight um, distraction from this, and you uh, 2 released Acton Baby, which ages me. And uh, the record shop opened early, 7.30, big posters outside, Acton Baby, first day of release. Took till 2.30 in the afternoon before somebody bought a copy of it. I'm going to come over here. Hierarchy based on 
the bands that they've spawned since. So like you start off with like uh, Joy Division. Oh, I like that. So that could almost be chronology as well. It could be time. Then you've it got could be a... like the connections they make between the other bands and who came first. And I'm liking that. And actually, that, although that sounds like a crazy idea, on a website you could do that. You would have the data to support that. On the cover, on the album cover. Oh. <laughs> do you work as a designer, sir? <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to take one more, I'm going to go back The number of babies that have conceived that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something you would like to tell us? <laughs> Love music. I now have a dreadful problem in that I need to go away and actually put together a business plan for this record store and almost there's too many good ideas and I think pretty much I might open a record store and change the organisation every week. If I did that, would you buy records from me? Yes. That's what well, a bit more yes would be good. But yes! Yes. So thank you very much for indulging me. I'm going to go and sort my record collection out. You are now all information architects. You're all fully qualified. Go out in the world and organise things.